Okay then, well, it appears that we are live for the unbelievable episode 49 of Space Rocks Uplink. Um, I'm just about to bring Mark McQuarkin in. Um, you know, we've uh, we've been on a brief hiatus, uh, a journey through space and time of a different kind. Mark, how are you doing? And uh, well, nice to see you again. Thanks, Alex. Yes, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Um, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks, I think. And um... I'm going to be going to the end of the universe today, which is which is fun. Uh, I, I just wanted to say a, a couple of words there about why we took a hiatus. I mean, we haven't done much sort of crossover here that uh, you and I and a whole bunch of other people, including some of our um, Uplink viewers, Detlef Crozer in particular, has been have been riding for Heavy Metal Truants, uh, this charity for children's ch um, charities that you you organize every year. It's an amazing work. Uh, everybody been. Uh, peddling their hearts out to, to, to raise money. So thank you to everybody that's been taking part and everybody that's been donating money. And thank you, Alex, for organizing it in the first place. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure, Mark. You know, I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, um, you know, to do a bit of, you know, promotion for the heavy metal drones, of course, you know, it's, um, it's important to, to give back. I'm really grateful for all the people who've done so and who supported things like Space Rocks as well. You know, um, you know, the purpose of Space Rocks for people who aren't joining us, Mark, I mean, I think that you're always, you know, the, the best person to ask about um, why it is that we do this, you know, in terms of outreach and so on. Because, of course, we're always curious if we're seeing some new eyes joining us. And I think we definitely have a few tonight. Yeah, so Space Rocks grows out, has grown out of this you know, desire to engage people and enthuse people and inform people, excite people, you know, many possible words about what we do in space exploration, be that astrophysics going to the end of the universe or in, in our own galaxy, two topics we'll talk about this evening, or the solar system, which is very much in the news at the moment, uh, with the selection yesterday of two new missions to Venus. Um, but a lot of that often happens in a kind of a mediated way through social media, through uh, press conferences, through graphics and so on. And, and the idea that you, know, you and I had was to Kind of bring that to people in in live events where people can meet the scientists the astronauts but also the writers the filmmakers the actors the musicians who are inspired by what we do and we're inspired by what they do and space rocks has grown out of that with two big live events in the uk and then other smaller ones which we did until the coronavirus lockdown and we've been doing uplink now for wow well over a year now isn't it uh, 14 months this is episode 49 i think um to do to do what we can to bring those people together and to have interesting conversations and yeah i, I it's, it's it's the highlight of my week every week indeed indeed and um well i guess this is one that's um not to say that you play favorites you know um but this is perhaps one that i imagine is especially close to your heart as well yeah, absolutely. So tonight we're going to be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope, which you can see here in the background. Uh, I've been involved in JWST for 23 years. Um, I'm on the science team, the so-called science working group for JWST, and I'll be using it to observe the region behind me here, the Orion Nebula in the infrared in search of extremely low mass objects, much smaller than stars, things we think are there, but we we don't we haven't had the sensitivity to detect them before, um, and we're very close to launch now. Uh, so by the end of this year, JWST should be finally complete on an Ariane five launched into space, and then it begins its complicated journey to become a full observatory. And we'll talk about that with our two guests this evening. Um, so this evening we have John Mather who is the senior project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope on the NASA side. JWST is a collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, ESA, and CSA, the Canadian Space Agency. And John is the Nobel Prize winner in physics in 2006 for his work on the cosmic microwave background, uh, which was done with a satellite that he essentially invented and, and dreamt up when he was a young guy, a satellite called COBE. Uh, and in fact, I knew him. I was working at, at his his lab, Goddard Space Flight Center in in Maryland, the year before Kobe was launched. So we've have have a long history. Uh, and then John became the senior project scientist for JWST uh, around the late nineties, um, and we, when we when the project really pushed on. <clears throat> and our other guest this evening is Avina Van Dishuk, who is. Uh, 
very well-known, very uh, um, highly awarded astronomer who works on our own galaxy, which uh, looking in regions where stars are being formed, planets are being born, and in particular tracking down the chemistry of that process. And, and Avina is also the current president of the International Astronomical Union, which is the, the major body which speaks for astronomers around the world. So I'm thrilled to have two incredibly high profile guests on, but people I've known for a long time and uh, people I call friends. Indeed. Well, uh, well, I suppose without further ado, um, we're going to bring them in, um, you know, across the traverses of time and space. And uh, uh, well, just check if they can hear what I'm saying. Avina and John, how are you doing? Are you receiving? Oh, yes. Well, fantastic to have you aboard. And I think uh, John is um, just joining us as well. We'll just make sure that he's fully connected and uh, we'll begin. Uh, well, I guess what's sure to be a really interesting and free form chat. There you are, John, how you doing? Or are you receiving? Hey, yeah, my internet wasn't letting me in for some reason, so I switched something. Well, how, how, <laughs> how, how, how horribly rude. Well, look, it's an absolute pleasure to have you both here. Thank you so much, and I suppose, because this is intended to be a free form conversation. Um, and so we normally start with the, uh, the biggest questions and drill down. Now, anyone who's familiar, Avina, with JWST knows that its conception began decades ago. What were the original questions that it set out to answer and, and are they still relevant today? Well, uh, Alex, that is a very good question because uh, science evolves. And uh, indeed, uh, I think the original questions were that JDBST was going to answer was very much focused on what you see behind John there. <laughs> uh, the distant, uh, the first galaxies, first light, uh, the first galaxies, uh, the first stars in the universe. That uh, was also how the mission was designed to stare for a very long time at a single place. But then, you know, came the exoplanets. Um, even when we were having our first discussions in the science team, yeah, you know, exoplanets had been discovered, but they were not yet part of JBST science. That started to come only early 2000, that we said, hmm, you know, exoplanet science, that's gonna be important also for uh, JBST. So, so I think it's a mix. Yes, uh, some of the original questions are very much uh, relevant still, but new science has come in as well. No. So, so John, let me take you back to those early days and, and ask you, given the science questions about the early universe and, and then the, the kind of the four themes that we have, um, looking at the, the, the initial galaxies, which we'll go into more detail, but just at the very highest level, uh, the, the first light galaxies that were born just after the Big Bang, the evolution of galaxies, the formation and, and evolution of stars in our own galaxy, um, and then as it's become sort of this, this broad theme about exoplanets and the, the origin of planetary systems, what, what about that led us to this kind of crazy design? We're all very familiar with this design, but it looked insane, right, 30 years ago. Yeah, well, it only looked insane to some people. It seemed <laughs> like a perfectly obvious solution to our problem uh, to others. So uh, what it shows here is a, a gigantic telescope, much bigger than the Hubble. Uh, and that's necessary because the things that we said we had to see at the beginning of the universe were so faint and far away. Uh, it's also a, a naked telescope. It's open to the outer space so it can cool itself off. Uh, and that's because the radiation we need to pick up is infrared, which is light that has longer wavelengths than ordinary light. Uh, as, and um, so in order to pick up infrared wavelengths, we have to have a cold telescope. So we cool the telescope off to a very low temperature and we make it bigger. And that implies everything you see about that crazy design. And, and you know, a key thing about that, you know, obviously I have the picture behind me, but there's no real sense of scale there. Um, talk us through a little bit about the dimensions of that machine and, and also the fact that we cut, it's, it's too big to launch as it is. Yes, well, it's uh, enormous. That uh, golden hexagon that you see is uh, six and a half meters across which is much bigger than the diameter of the rocket inside, which is five meters. So it's uh, got to be folded up for launch. And that gray thing that you see there in the picture behind Mark is a five layer sunshade, a big umbrella to keep the sun off the telescope and let it get cold. And that is as big as a tennis court. 
So imagine your favorite tennis star is running back and forth on half of that uh, gray thing there. That's how big that is. And it's also got to be folded up for a launch inside the rocket. Now, one, one thing to come back to you, Avina, one thing that wasn't in there in the beginning was the instrument you're most closely associated with, the mid-infrared instrument. So perhaps you can walk us through a little bit for the general public audience, you know, what, what, when we say infrared, what do we mean? And what's the difference between near infrared and mid infrared? And of course you've worked on missions like Herschel, which are far infrared and submillimeter. So this is a kind of a special region, but your region wasn't covered to begin with. Right? Uh, exactly, exactly. Well, it, it was going to the near infrared. So that is just a few microns. So the, the light that we can no longer see with our eyes, but that's still closest to sort of the red part. Uh, of the spectrum if you go to slightly longer wavelengths. And then if you just keep going to longer and longer wavelengths, by the time you are, say, at, at five microns, uh, then you get into what is we call the mid-infrared part. And uh, then it also becomes, uh, you get into different uh, technologies, you get into different uh, physical processes that contribute there. And um, not so much Herschel, we had just had the infrared space observatory, the ISO satellite. In, uh, that flew in uh, the, the mid 1990s. And by the time sort of the, the whole discussion about the instruments on JWST started, uh, that's when we could bring in all the great results that had come from the ISO satellite in that part of the spectrum, sort of the longer wavelengths where you see, for example, the vibrations of, of water, uh, you see those uh, very clearly. Uh, so um, it's uh, all, all kinds of ices, all kinds of gases that uh, have their primary uh, signatures there. Um, gases, methane, CO2, et cetera, all kinds of uh, gases that we are interested for, for planets and uh, for building planets. So it was an obvious wavelength region to cover. And it, it was challenging. I mean, when we looked at the, the, the specifications, it was always there sort of as a possible add-on. Um, but then we could make the science case. Um, and uh, I think that that was key to make the science case. Um, and I think it was also key that the science case, uh, the support came from, from both continents, uh, from the US and from Europe. Um, and in fact, very naturally, we came to a sort of a, um, uh, an agreement, a 50-50 uh, partnership that I think that just took a one conversation at the coffee, <laughs> at the coffee table to, <laughs> to come to such an agreement. <laughs> I, I wish life was always that easy. Um, so, 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 John, let's jump back to the near infrared before, before I hand back to Alex. So the basic, the kind of the original design is, is focused sort of, let's say, between one and five microns in that region. Um, it's, the telescope's already emitting, if it wasn't cold, it would be emitting light, but it also, we're above the Earth's atmosphere and we want to get rid of that glowing light in the near infrared. But why the infrared at all? You know, why do, why do I need to do that? Hubble, that picture behind you is brilliant, right? I mean, it shows yes. me all the galaxies I would want. Why would I want to build another telescope? Well, uh, number one, uh, it doesn't show I, other galaxies that we wanted to see. Uh, Hubble was built with the intention of seeing the very first galaxies as they grew from the Big Bang material. And uh, that picture behind me says, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Um, the uh, galaxies formed much earlier, uh, which means uh, we can see them by looking farther back in time, which means we see them um, more red shifted. So there's a, the expansion of the universe stretches out the light uh, wavelengths from small to large. So what starts off as uh, visible light from stars ends up as infrared when it arrives at our telescope. So, okay. Build us a bigger telescope than to pick up those first galaxies with infrared. Uh, and the more infrared, the better, because who knows how far back in time we have to see. So um, that uh, supported the mid-infrared instrument that Evine was talking about. Uh, and it's uh, always very tricky to figure out what you're looking at when all you can see is a little fuzzy dot and with a color. And so we have uh, built a very powerful set of instruments with uh, what we call spectrometers, which spreads out the light of the star or a galaxy into a whole rainbow. You can use that to get the chemistry as well as the speed of motion inside it. So that's just one of the reasons why we need the infrared. We can also see things that are too cool to send out visible light. So you sitting there, each of us is transmitting 500 watts of infrared power. And of course, you can't pick it up with a camera. Uh, we need a special infrared camera to pick that up. 
So we'd like to see everything from those first galaxies to uh, nearby planets uh, being born around other stars today. All of those things require the infrared. And, this, and again, just, so we've, just to jump in, the, the thing which is important to the, some of this stuff I do is that dust is is tr relatively transparent in the infrared. So Avena's got these dark clouds behind hey. her head there. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, if that's the Milky Way and people initially thought they're just holes in space, but they're actually regions full of dust, which are hard to see in in the visible. But in the infrared, m miraculously, just because of the weight, the size of the dust particles, we can see straight into those regions, which is yeah, sort of a great it's, thrill when you just strip away the dust and you see the stuff inside. Well, exactly. And uh, that's uh, indeed why I put that picture in there, because uh, um, that those dusty clouds, um, that's when we look at them with our own eyes, but indeed in the infrared, the, the dust becomes transparent and then we can look deep inside at uh, new stars that are actually being formed there. So, um, and that's what I like. I mean, we can, this uh, JWS TV can penetrate into these dusty regions where in fact, you know, almost all the action happens. Uh, new stars are born inside these dark clouds. <clears throat> Our solar system once was born in a dark cloud uh, like that. Um, galaxies are very dusty in uh, their early stages. Um, so yeah, we also need it for that reason. Yeah, incredibly exciting science. And I wonder if we could flip back to the very beginning where we talked about like the actual evolution of the questions, you know, that we're, we're trying to answer and so on. John, you know, the kind of timescales that are involved with JWST or, or many other missions as well, fascinate me simply because they are so different from the kind of timescales that, you know, many of us are kind of familiar with. What does it feel like knowing that we finally arrived at the year where this is going to happen? I mean, usually it invites comparisons to, is it like a thousand Christmases or so on? But, but what's the feeling of knowing that this is due to come to fruition? Because I guess you've been on the edge of your seat for, for some yeah. time. Yeah, so um, we've been working on this since late 95. Uh, when the first uh, little booklet was written by a committee that said, please build us one of those telescopes. And they had already in mind all these great questions. Uh, they didn't know whether it was possible to build what they asked for. So um, we've uh, had to invent 10 different things before we could actually finish the design of the observatory. So that's what took most of the time. And then you get to the place where, well, now I've built it, now I got to prove that it's right. Uh, and this is the big scary thing about all of our deep space missions. There just is no way to get out there to fix them if you make a mistake. So Hubble, you know, has been serviced five times by astronauts going up to visit. And we can't do that with a web telescope. So I mean, test everything, everything, everything. So that's where the time goes. And I'm glad we do that because I want it to work. <laughs> so explain for us, John, why it is that unlike Hubble, we can't go and visit JWST. What, why it's necessarily in a very different place to where Hubble is. Oh, okay, well, we, the Hubble is uh, close to Earth and you can read it, reach it with a space shuttle or astronauts can go there. We don't have the shuttle anymore, but we have other rockets that could go there. Um, but the, uh, the idea that we have to cool the telescope off as this uh, crazy open design shows uh, means you cannot keep it near Earth. Earth will keep it warm. So there was no way to solve that problem when we looked because that was a hard thing to do. So got to send it a long ways away. So get it far as possible from Earth, but not too far. So we found a place called the Lagrange Point L2 orbit area, which is about 1.5 million, million kilometers from Earth. So it's a whole lot farther than a space shuttle can go. But it's the place, it's the first place, it's the only place you can go where it stays close, relatively close to Earth and uh, doesn't escape. And uh, I was still able to uh, use a single-sided umbrella to keep the telescope cold. So it's the special spot in our solar system. And we should explain, some people have asked this question, well, aren't you launching lots of things to L2? I mean, we, we've had Herschel and Planck there, we'll be sending other missions there in the future. Won't they bump into each other? Isn't there a problem? I mean, and of course, it's a bit of a lie because it's not really a place in space. It's a big orbit that's actually hundreds of thousands of kilometers across. <clears throat> yes, that's right. So we know that how to manage things out there, but we're, it would, we would really have to work very hard to get them to bump into each other. <laughs> It would be nice if uh, JWST could take a picture of uh, Herschel, for example. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it's not so hard to send a little payload out there with a camera. Yeah. Um, but um, 
Anyway, the none are currently planned for the purpose you just named. Picture of another telescope. So, if if we you know talk, you, you mentioned the ten things we had to solve. I mean, it, it's probably too much to go into all of those, but you know, it, it, which are the things? Well, probably some things kept you awake at night in the early days, and then some others in the later days. I mean, that's certainly true for me that. You know, in the early days, you thought, how are we ever going to make these mirrors, this enormous thing, but light enough that it fits inside the payload? So maybe talk us through a couple of those things like the mirrors and, and why they're so special. OK, well, the mirrors are special because they're ultralight. Um, that uh, mirror that you see that's six and a half uh, meters across, um, each of those 18 hexagons you could lift with your hands. Uh, so why do we have to make it so light? Because the rocket is actually uh, less powerful than the space shuttle. Uh, so we've got to, and we've got to put the thing way, way, way out there. So, um, okay, got to make it really light and still really big. And then it's got to be the right shape when it's cold. So, you know, when you make a mirror and you cool it down, it's going to twist and distort because of the temperature. And so have to solve that problem. Uh, so, so we solved it. Um, then uh, we have to make the world's best infrared detectors. So we do have them. Uh, these are the world's most sensitive. And so it means that... Uh, Hmm. It's just an extraordinarily powerful telescope. The detectors are so powerful that if you were a little bumblebee, a small insect, one square centimeter, uh, hovering at the distance of the moon, we would be able to see you with our new telescope. So uh, that was a rather shocking fact to discover that uh, it was so powerful. And so I had to check it myself. And it's right. And um, of course, there are no little bumblebees out there. And most things are not sitting still. But nevertheless, it is an extraordinarily powerful thing, and it gives us great confidence that we can discuss or that we can discover something that we would never even guess is there. So, possibility of a great surprise. Yeah. Now, I, I'm going to do something extremely dangerous. You know, I, if I've learned anything, it's not to ever question a Nobel Prize winner, particularly if it's live. But I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I've, I've heard you talk about this bumblebee at the moon, and, and it is true, but. I worked it out recently and I thought, yes, you can, but it will take you five days. Now, and when I, and, and you've said this before as well. So I think that the important point is to point out that that's actually not unusual with what we'll be doing with JWST. It's not a video camera. It's not just going to take a picture in a 30th of a second and move on. Five day exposures will be actually not, not super common, but we'll do them. And why is that again? You know, how, how does that work? Well, we do that because the, little particles of light, the photons of light coming from those galaxies behind my head here come in very infrequently. So you just have to have a really long exposure time to catch enough. So even with this gigantic telescope, we have to have a long exposure time because we're after the ultimate. We want to see that as far as we possibly can. And so, um, yes, we will indeed point the telescope at one spot for days at a time, maybe weeks. I mean, I think I'm not sure which version of the Hubble Deep Field you have there or one of the deep fields, but these are up to a month long, if, if I'm right in my, in my memory. Now, now, Avina, you're doing something kind of different. I mean, there may be reasons to look at some regions for very long times, but you're probably also after statistical samples of objects because it's one of the weird things in astronomy, which people forget, is it's not really an experimental science most of the time. We can't go somewhere, poke it, see how it responds. We can really only learn about the evolution of objects by looking at enough objects that we can piece a sequence together. So talk us through a little bit about the, the, the things you're interested in finding with JWST, the, the things we don't know, the, the bits of the sequence of planet building, which are still a bit of a mystery to us. Yeah, no, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. Uh, that's, uh, uh, and indeed JWST is, uh, is designed as a telescope to stare for a very long time at a single place. But what we want to do in galactic science most of the time is indeed uh, relatively short, meaning sort of half an hour, hour uh, exposures on uh, stars that are forming, on uh, planets, that's regions where planets are forming. Uh, and of course, on the exoplanets themselves. Um, and uh, there, indeed, you want to have statistics uh, in order to piece together the, the sequence. Uh, you want to have enough um, objects in a certain category in order to, to, to say something about how it evolves. So I think the biggest questions are at the very early stages. So what we call the protostars, just after one of these dark clouds has collapsed, 
to form a, uh, uh, it's not even yet a, a star in the sense of burning uh, hydrogen. Uh, it is, is really still uh, getting its luminosity, its, 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 its power light actually from the, uh, from the collapse process, from the, from the gravitational uh, pool, so to say. Um, but uh, there, exactly how that happens, so many things happen there. There are jets, you know, going out of there. There's accretion going on. There's a, a disk forming around a young star, and uh, all of these have signatures in the uh, in the in the infrared that we can pick up with JWST. And and I think there is really where JWST will provide important parts of the puzzle. I think the next stage, uh, so that's a very messy stage, I would say, <laughs> and where we have lots of different things happening at the same time, accretion, but at the same time also uh, the young system trying to push away its surroundings. Um, if we go to the uh, somewhat later stages, then that whole sort of cloud has dissipated, but now we're left with this, this disk around the young stars in which planets are likely forming already. And I think there the exciting part is that with JDBST, um, we will not be able to take nice pictures of those disks, but we will be able to study in exquisite detail the, the composition actually of the material out of which uh, those planets will be built. So, um, so, so I think that is also very exciting. And there, I think, again, uh, where statistics will play a very important role in, in, in sort of the, 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 the composition of the material that ultimately will become planets. So some of these, you know, you, you think it's fair to call you an astrochemist, among many other things. The chemistry is remarkable in some of these regions. I mean, often you'll see the headlines come out, particularly in the more prurient British press, about how much alcohol there is, you know, around a young star. And there's all sorts of weird and wonderful chemicals out there. So, you know, how does all of that happen? I mean, how does that soup come together in these places? Because it's not it's not kind of the stuff that's expelled from the previous generation of stars. In some cases it is, but these clouds, they're chemistry factories, and it's a very strange kind yeah. of yeah. stuff that goes on in there. Well, indeed, indeed. And uh, in fact, we now know that most of that alcohol is actually on the rocks. Uh, so it's literally, <laughs> <laughs> it's literally made <laughs> on the surfaces of those tiny little dust grains, sink of them as sands of grain, uh, gra gra that uh, grain uh, of sand that are, are just, uh, you know, uh, a fraction of a, a thousand times smaller than a, a, um, a sand grain. Um, that you find on the beach. Um, and it's really on those surfaces that you can bring a, a hydrogen and an uh, oxygen uh, together. Um, because somehow you have to get rid of that binding energy. So you have to make that bond and that, that, has, to get, that has to go somewhere. And it can go in, in that uh, grain. And so you make, you know, bits by bits, you make water uh, on the surface of the grain, uh, you make, uh, uh, alcohol on that grain, um, uh, methane, so CO2, uh, all of those simple and also more complex molecules, they are formed already in the very cold phase in those dark clouds, uh, perhaps even prior to collapse of the, uh, of the cloud to form a, a, a protostar. So Alex, I give the floor back to you. I, 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 it's terrible. I, I, I'm not saying I know all the answers to the questions, but I certainly know the questions. Go for it. No, no, no. Um, well, no, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me, of course. But I guess, you know, in the uh, the field of space rocks, you know, my experience has been that, you know, some of the fundamentals of, you know, why we do the things we do um, can be difficult to communicate as well. And and I was I wondered if, you know, just like in terms of like the, the history of JWST, you know, its development and so on, how challenging has it been to... I guess, you know, assert the purpose of JBST, you know, through many different governments, administrations and so on, because a project of that time scale has outlived many key decision makers and people, you know, who, you know, perhaps, you know, um, may question, you know, the need for some of this. I mean, because of course, I mean, I think you're talking to a very sympathetic audience, you know, tonight, because, you know, the reason for research, the reason for discovery is self-evident. That's not always the case. Have there been challenges along the way? And what's that road been like? Well, I think we actually had no problem explaining the purpose. Um, people loved what we said we would do. Uh, they uh, were inspired by the idea that we would be able to look back in time and to learn about the history of the universe and how 
the Big Bang could turn into galaxies and stars and planets and eventually have places where life could occur. All of that's pretty uh, enchanting to people. Uh, it is to me. Um, and so that's not the hard part. The hard part is, are you sure you can do that? Yeah. Are you sure you can build that telescope? Uh, so uh, when we started off, uh, our administrator said, I want you to build it for half a billion dollars. Well, it cost about 20 times as much as that uh, because wanting to do it and being able to do it are pretty different. So uh, we had many times through history where um, we were disappointed that we couldn't do it for the price that we thought we could before. So well, there was a time when it was almost canceled. Um, and so um, people came together and said, yeah, we really want this telescope. You know, volunteers uh, jumped up and uh, lobbied the Congress, of course, scientists like uh, me at NASA, we don't visit the Congress, but everyone else can. So uh, eventually, um, because partly because it's an international project with Europe and Canada also chipping in a lot, uh, people said, yeah, okay, this was a really serious commitment. We really should finish it. And so not only that, um, there's no other way to do this science. You cannot make a small telescope that'll do that. Uh, no matter how long you wait, you'll never figure out these problems. So we already have smaller telescopes. It was mentioned earlier that ISO mission and the US had a smaller space telescope called the Spitzer mission. The, the Hubble is up there still, but it can't see what we're going to see. So uh, the challenge was mostly technical and budget. So are, are we there yet? No, not quite, but almost. <laughs> Yes, John, and I think it's very good that you stress this international aspect, because I think if you want to do sort of these biggest projects, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, a country like the US has, to, has the means to do it, but uh, really the international collaboration adds to it and, and stabilizes the project uh, in that sense, and, uh, uh, and has, has certainly also in terms of the instruments that are on board uh, also contributed very significantly there. Yeah, we should say, actually, who's doing, doing what. Yeah. Um, Europe is buying the rocket. So it's going to be an Ariane rocket going up from French Guiana in November. That's the most likely date is or middle of, roughly middle of November uh, these days. And uh, Europe has also built the near-infrared spectrograph instrument, uh, the cold half of the mid-infrared instrument, which is the hard part. And um, and Canada has built the uh, a near-infrared imaging spectros slitless spectrometer, and also the fine guidance camera, which says we're going to lock the pointing of the telescope onto that star and make sure the pictures are sharp. So a very international project, and uh, that uh, has actually enabled us to do more challenging things that we could have done uh, if it was just the United States. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that because, and, and don't take this the wrong way at all, what's, in a way, what's remarkable to me is that in the same time scale as JWST has been under development. I got involved in 1998. That was a year before the very large telescope opened up in, in Chile, um, a ground-based telescope. And I think, you know, Euro European astronomy has come an enormous distance in those intervening uh, 23 years. And it's, it's interesting. I, I, I wouldn't even call it surprising now, but perhaps back in the day, Europe has competed for roughly 30% of the of the observing time in an open, transparent way. Nothing, no allocations. It's just, you know, we're, we're doing great astronomy in Europe and great astronomy in partnership with the US on a whole range of missions. And so let me think, change that into a question for you, Avina. you know, putting another hat on now. You're the president of the International Astronomical <laughs> Union, which, of course, is beyond these four, the, these, uh, these three partners, ESA, which is 22 countries, Canada and the United States, anybody can apply to use JWST. I think that's important to say as well. It's an open telescope. Anywhere in the world, you have to get good science, but you have to write it, but you're not precluded. But how do you see, I mean, how have you seen it change? I mean, you, over the years in, in, a, in astronomy in general, in collaborative terms and, and picking out these big challenges that we can only solve together, so to speak. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that has, uh, as you say, over the last 20 years has, has become much, much stronger than uh, before. And what has helped also enormously is the concept of open data, open archives. That has been so transformational for getting many more people involved 
Um, even with a short proprietary time, that's fine. Uh, but uh, then opening up all these archives, enabling so much more research and uh, even some satellites, I'm thinking now of the Gaia satellite, that makes all of its data immediately public. And so a researcher in South Africa or Southeast Asia can do uh, the same research as, as we are doing here in the Netherlands or in, uh, or in the US. So I think that is uh, fantastic in, in sort of um, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, the whole community actually gets, uh, yeah, the buck for the money uh, that they actually, of course, the taxpayers put in, uh, in the end. I, I think also what is important, um, I'm now speaking more from the International Union, uh, Astronomical Union side, um, and of course, we don't build instruments, we don't have money <laughs> to do that, but we can bring the people together. And uh, we can bring them together in a very early stage. And uh, that's what we are trying to do is sort of, you know, try to bring sort of these these people together and, and see whether partnerships, you know, plant a little seed, so to say, that could grow, um, you know, 10 years later, five years later into uh, one of these kinds of collaborations. Um, so I think that is, uh, in, in addition to the more traditional role that we, of course, have in terms of conferences, and I'm, I'm sure that there will be a nice sessions on JWS2 as soon as we have data. <laughs> Um, so in, in addition to that traditional role that one has in terms of having uh, conferences, symposia, etc., cetera, um, there's also this role of very early, you know, as a neutral partner, bringing uh, parties together and, and having them think and try to work together rather than uh, compete. Hmm. I'm, I'm provoked a little bit. I do a lot of um, media interviews to do with the other half. I mean, I'm working in the science directorate at ESA, but also in the human robotic exploration directorate. And so, of course, there when it comes to humans in space and it comes to the moon and it comes to Mars. There's discussion about a new space race. I, I don't think I see it that way, but I'm interested in your perspective as very senior representatives of the astronomy community working internationally. Um, do you see that perhaps we might move back a little bit in that direction, whether it's in human space flight or in exploration? I think it would be a bad thing, but what's your perspective? And, you know, looking at the, I, I don't want to use the term the rise of China. That's the wrong way of looking at it. But China, with its lunar program and its Mars program, is doing very impressive things at the moment. Um, so I'm just interested in your perspective on that. It's not to do with JWST as such. Well, I mean, what you see, indeed, the, the moon, I was just going to use the moon as the example, because we, uh, uh, I mean, not just China, but India, of course, uh, has gone there, other nations has gone there. It's very interesting, you know, when we looked at the 50 years moon landing uh, in 2019, uh, how you see that in the early days, of course, there was uh, the US, uh, Russia also, there and then for a while it was just you know us going to the moon and then you know now you see all of a sudden an uptake of more and more countries uh, going there and, and then the same may be happening with mars um, maybe with venus again <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, with the, the recent announcements of uh, missions going there so so i think to one sense that's that's okay that's every you know new um um the newcomers in sort of the space, they need to sort of learn on how to do these things themselves. You can only become a partner when you have grown already, when you have already developed sort of the technology and the knowledge yourself, then, then you are a good partner. And, and for that, you, you, you need to do some missions also yourself before you can become a partner in one of these bigger missions. So, so I think I think to something I think it's actually a good thing that many countries are doing this and, and not just to look up. I mean, of course, also look down. There's there's I mean, think of all the cube sets yeah. <laughs> that are actually looking down uh, uh, small small uh, satellites that uh, developing countries can build and that they can use for agriculture or traffic or whatever. Um, I think again, they are learning how to use um, telescopes um, or satellites in space. Hmm. John? Yeah, um, things have gotten cheaper a bit lately. We've got uh, rocket companies that are uh, much advertising much lower prices than what we paid decades ago. So suddenly people are getting ingenious. Uh, we've got the CubeSats where uh, individual humans or individual university groups can actually afford to, to learn how to do it and have their teach, teach their students how to do it. 
and actually set them up to be part of the aerospace enterprise. So, uh, by the way, as a sort of matter of perspective, uh, the science and uh, advanced explorations that we see in the space agencies is a tiny fraction of the worldwide space program. Uh, much more than 90% of it goes into uh, commercial things, uh, broadcasting information down to earth, uh, relaying our communications, uh, a little bit of information. Uh, uh, our security agencies, of course, need to know what's going on. Um, that it's almost uh, almost all somebody else besides the part that you see. Uh, the GPS that we use every day to now anyway to drive from place to place. Um, that was a military product. Now it's a civilian product, and that's uh, much more money in that than there is in all of the science that we ever have done. <laughs> So, you know, you mentioned the commercial players in this game and particularly the rocket companies, the launchers, and they're now on the critical path to putting humans uh, back on the surface of the moon. But do you, do you foresee a day in which there may be a commercial driver towards the kind of space exploration we're talking about here, the pure science? Because I think what what's often lost in this discussion, and I hear it all the time in public talks I give, is oh you 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 know you governments you're just the old school way of doing space, the old way of doing science, but we you know we come from a very different perspective. We are here for all the people, the taxpayers that pay for it, and it's a, it's incumbent on us to return that in a non proprietary open data way, as Avina said. But also you know it's that you can also perhaps philosophically take a slightly higher perspective on it. It's not just about making money. It's, it's in fact, it doesn't make any money or maybe, but uh, so, so do you think that civil space agencies will be out of the business in, in 20 years time or will we still have a role? Um, myself, I think uh, we still have a very large role because um, science doesn't give immediate return, does not give immediate commercial return. So there have been times in history when science was paid for by rich people or by military. And I think it's better now that we can do it for civilian agencies where we share everything that we find with everyone who wants to know. So that's the job of space agencies. And I don't think it's going to be really replaced by uh, private funding or by any other source. So it's up to us uh, that work for these company agencies to make it happen. I think there's no shortage of things to do. I think our uh, plans include at least 50 or 100 years worth of observatories to imagine and build, and uh, there's no shortage of things to discover. Exactly. So, but John, I mean, uh, the space agencies now have partners in these commercial companies that can indeed, as you say, launch now uh, uh, the satellites for less money than we used to have to pay for them. So, so yeah. there is a, there, yeah. And they can do it quicker if they want to. <laughs> Yeah. They don't have to ask yeah. Congress first to whether whether they can do what they want to do. They yeah. say, we're yeah. going to do it. Now do you want the product? That's, yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I'll put my hand up and say that, of course, you know, ESA has never owned in the full sense a rocket company. Neither has NASA. It's always been done with contractors. It's, it's also about the way that you let the contracts and the way that you run it, as you say. So it's kind of a, a revolution underway there. Um, Alex, let me hand it back to you to... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's curious because, of course, um, you know, while the um, while the data is open, I mean, um, space, as Mark and I, we've frequently spoken about, you know, just like, you know, in various episodes of Uplink, um, it's frequently used as an expression of political preeminence. You know, um, it's not merely the, the data, you know, that you receive. It's also an expression of, you know, just like a, a, of other things, you know, of political capital, you know, and so on. And I suppose that's an interesting parallel to always, you know, sort of be aware of and all these things, because, you know, we're so conscious of, you know, the challenges, you know, that sometimes arise when developing these things. But but I wondered if we could, you know, actually divert a little bit, because um, we've used a word a few times, you know, in the course of tonight's conversation, which is the word we. Exactly how many people are behind a project of this scale? I mean, because just to give people a sense, because the number you usually hear is the price tag. But what I'm really interested in is just like how many people over the years have been involved in making this thing go up? Because I mean, to me, it feels like an incalculable amount of effort and also something else, hope. A lot of people watching later this year, right? Yeah, well, yes, uh, to give actual numbers, the US portion of the Webb telescope budget's about 10 billion. I don't actually have numbers for the European and Canadian pieces, but it's pretty substantial. So that means thousands of people for working for a long time 
is what it takes. So it's not, it's just not a small village. It's a big town that it takes to put all this work together and make it really go. So it's a huge investment of, of people's time and thought and money. Um, and so I'm really pleased that the world has found a way to do this because there's no other way to do this exploration. Um, but we didn't have to, we could have stayed home. Yeah. Well, well, this is the thing that fascinates me, right? Because, I mean, you know, anybody who's ever been on a committee knows getting people to agree to anything is unbelievable. So it seems that, you know, beyond the actual scope of the engineering required to achieve this, the questions you're hoping to answer and innovating in ways where you're basically, you're, you're building technologies that have just never, simply never existed before. You're also doing something far harder, which I suppose is something we're all familiar with, um, whatever projects we might be involved in, is getting everyone to agree on things, right? That's a management task that itself deserves some kind of tome, in my opinion, just, just to get the thing moving, right? It's true. <laughs> um, but uh, of course, it's not that it was randomly assembled by from molecules. It's that we have a system uh, that's been built up over decades of agencies uh, around the world that are able to do this. So it's not like, oh, I have a thought. I better find 10,000 people. It's no, I have a thought. I know who to talk to. Mm. In my, just from my perspective as a member of the science working group, and I'm not close to the technical side in that sense. I mean, I haven't built any of the instruments. Um, I've been you know, watching from the science. For me, you know, when this is flown and when this is produced data, I think when the books are written, and we know that a book is being written by Robert Smith, our, the, the historian working on the project, I think the biggest chapter will be system engineering. Um, that idea of, of somebody like on our project, Mike Menzel, uh, who's able, you know, to, uh, um, remarkably to be able to sleep, which I don't understand how that's possible, knowing what he knows about how all the things interplay or, you know, if you if you get something wrong slightly over here on this corner, what will it impact on that corner? And, and you know, the, the ripple through, because it's not a whole bunch of boxes just bolted together, all of which individually work. It's an incredibly complex system. So I just wonder, you know, John, talk us a little bit through that. I mean, how, how does one even train to become a, a system engineer? Probably scientists aren't very good at it, I would, I would aver, but, you know. Possibly not. Uh, when I got my Nobel Prize, I thought, how am I going to spend my check? Um, I thought the first thing that most that I care most about is finding more systems engineers because they have almost magical talent to say, these are the parts that have to fit together. And this is how they have to fit together and then dividing up the work so that people, individual people and teams can make that happen. So um, I said, well, why, where can I find more of those people? And I asked around and nobody knows. Now they basically said, uh, well, uh, we find people who are able to do it and we ask them to. <laughs> And so no, and you're absolutely right in that how critical this is. I remember times in the Miri project that, uh, you know, during the whole design and building phase, that when we got to a consortium meeting, the first thing that was happening was that the system engineers just pasted the whole wall of the meeting room with the with the whole system diagram <laughs> and just so that everybody could see you know where what was connected with what and what was going where and so on and so forth so uh, absolutely critical the system engineer mm. i mean as, as one illustration of that john just a, a, this this business of this <clears throat> big sun shield it's not only shield as you said earlier on it's not only shielding the telescope the, the cold side i mean we'll never see a picture like this right i mean th there would never be a picture with the jwst in sunlight that's the whole idea is that the sun's all on the other side always um but that sun shield not only shields the telescope from the sun but it also shields from the earth and also the moon and, and working out exactly where all of those objects are moving as JWST is moving and making sure no light leaks over the edge because we have these requirements on the telescope, right? Talk us through this sort of background issue and, and, and what we're trying to dig down to because in the end, there's a fundamental limit in space, which we, we can't, to say we can't go beyond it, we can always go out of the solar system, but in our solar system, there's fundamental limits. Yes, um, so I think Mark's talking about uh, the fact that the sky is bright uh, and uh, no matter what you do, um, if you try to take a, take a time exposure, you're going to get a bright sky. Uh, and so that limits what you can see. So you want, you want to make sure the telescope isn't adding to that. So bright lights shining on the mirrors would be a problem. So um, we have designed a telescope that's not protected. The Hubble telescope's in a tube. 
and our telescope, Webb, is wide open. So the galaxy can shine on it. Uh, the solar system can shine on it. And the mirrors have to be kept uh, extremely clean. Otherwise, the dust that's on the mirrors will, will uh, cause them to glow. So that's been the big challenge for a long time, is keeping everything clean. So when you see our, our team members walking around in their bunny suits all completely covered up head to toe in white with gloves and masks, it's not just for uh, keeping us safe from bugs, it's for keeping the telescope clean. And uh, all of that has to be worked out bit by bit. Uh, and uh, systems engineers are part of that. They say, well, you can have so much dust over there if it's clean over there. And so this is part of our engineering process is to work out all the consequences of your question. Yeah. And, and that sun shield is, you know, you don't want to make it much bigger than than it needs to be. So it's actually remarkably close to just about the right size. I've forgotten now exactly, but it's within um, centimeters, maybe. If, if it's wrong by a centimeter or something in the wrong direction, we will see over the edge at certain points and see the moon in the background. Yeah, it's it's very optimized. <laughs> no bigger than necessary and no smaller, <laughs> which means you got to be sure. Um, you know, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I should, uh, you know, acknowledge is, of course, we have people watching tonight, um, you know, uh, people joining us from all over the world, and, um, and we welcome them to the conversation, and I always love the perspective that we get from people who are watching, um, you know, and, and, and a really obvious one, you know, that we haven't actually, you know, talked about is, you know, isn't it amazing, Vagabondo says that, you know, for instance, you know, uh, the Voyager missions, you know, alive, still kicking. Well, that, what is the lifespan of JWST? What are we What are we expecting? What are we hoping for? Oh, well, we're carrying fuel for at least 10 years of operation. Um, it's hard to prove if data design that's going to last that long because you can't test it for 10 years before you fly it. You just build it and fly it. So uh, we design it with the intention of lasting a long time and having nothing that wears out except running out of fuel. Mm. So that's the plan. And then uh, space business is what it is. So you have to plan for things breaking. So when you have that challenge, you say, well, I better have two transmitters and two receivers and two sets of electronics for my receivers and detectors and all that. So we do what we can to make it last a long time, even if some random part fails. Uh, so our hope, my hope is that it lasts a lot longer than 10 years, but there's always a chance that, oh, darn, something just broke. That's how it goes. So, so let me just, because this is one of the things, again, it, it's it's a technical thing, but it's always fascinating to me. Why do we even need fuel? I mean, when, when you say fuel, we're not driving anywhere with it, mostly, right? It's mostly about another part of the observatory, which Hubble doesn't have to do because Hubble's in the Earth's magnetic field and it can, but I'll let you talk about it because you yeah. know, it's just fascinating. Why would you ever run out of fuel? Right? Okay, well, two need, two uses we have of fuel. One is that the orbit we're in is called the Lagrange by orbit, but it's unstable. So if you don't manage, you'll fall off the top of the hill and slide down and go escape. So you don't want to do that. So you watch very carefully that you're still on top of the hill. And then once in a while you have to use a little fuel with jets to stay there. And the other thing is the sunshine pushes on that gigantic umbrella and it uh, produces a torque, which in, tries to turn over the telescope. And if you didn't do something about it, it would tumble over in about a day. So, okay, so once in a while we fire the jets to deal with that. So we have a plan. And if we're good drivers, we won't use up all the gas right away. Because we have big gyroscopes on board as well, which help, this is true of most of our spacecraft, we point around on the gyroscopes, but at some point the gyroscopes get saturated and we just have to offload all that angular momentum. I've always wondered, I'm going to ask you now, that because I've, I'm sure I've asked it in the SWIG, the Science Working Group, why didn't we put on a small deployable um, sail which we could angle at the back so that we once we're in orbit we know exactly where the center of light pressure is relative to the center of gravity to just trim that off i, I know the answer but i've never been thrilled by the answer yeah, so we actually do have a, uh, a deployable sail uh, that uh, sets it up so that the average torque is about right and it's called well, i forget what the actual name of it is um, anyway, it's a little flap that sticks out from the end of the observatory, and it's not you can't see it on the picture behind you, yeah. but there is one. It's uh, several meters in size. Yes. So it's there, um, but we have to set it in advance and so use our best calculation to say which angle it should be at. 
Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, your, your idea is a good one. It right. could have saved fuel. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the argument is that it's just another thing that if it breaks in the wrong position, then you lose the mission. So better know, better the you know the devil you know rather than buying a new yeah. a new one. I mean, yeah. it's provoking me to think. Going back to you, Avina, you, you're involved in Herschel quite heavily and have written this lovely review paper recently on all of the discoveries about water. I mean, Herschel was launched without even the ability to focus the telescope. Which is, I mean, if you think about all of the complicated fo focusing and alignment mechanisms on JWST, that was some gutsy system engineering to say, I know where the focus is going to be when it's in space and it's been shaken. And it was fine, but wow. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, that was a nerve wracking uh, sort of uh, first light uh, <laughs> to see what, uh, what was uh, was happening. So, so yeah, no, absolutely. You know, you, that's, you know, indeed in the design, what's what do you take as a risk how much are you willing to risk and uh what do you build in as to um yeah that you can still tweak um yeah yeah it's, it's the choice it's the hard <laughs> choice that you make, really so, make. So I, i'm conscious of time and i wanted to do before we maybe take another question, Alex, I wanted to ask John to, to walk us through what's going to happen later this year and the beginning of next year, because we don't just launch and we get pictures back the next day. That's not how it's going to work at all. So, in fact, it's up to six months before we're going to be in a position to do science. But that's by design. So talk us through the commissioning and the deployment process, John. Yes. OK, so after we launch, uh, we do a number of things right away. First thing to be sure of is we have the transmitter antenna is out so we can talk back to earth well and the uh, solar panels are out so uh, the battery doesn't run down so that's done uh, in the first hour or so uh, after launch and then we uh, steer ourselves towards the right place uh, i think we fire the jets twice at least on the way out to the right orbit it takes about a month to get all the way out to near the lagrange point and uh, it takes about a month for the telescope to be clean enough so that we can cool it down so we keep it warm for a while Everybody's worried about water coming out from the warm parts of the observatory and condensing onto those beautiful cold golden mirrors. So we keep the mirrors warm long enough so we're pretty sure the telescope is going to be dry. No ice will grow on those lovely mirrors. Then after we let it cool down, then it starts to get to the right temperature and it's still not ready to focus. So I forgot to mention that, of course, we have to unfold it shortly after launch. We take yeah. uh, about two oh, just, weeks. just that, just the unfolding part. <laughs> it takes about two weeks to unfold it. And of course, that is a very great movie. Yes, you see that, yeah. It's a scary movie that we have of this. Yeah. And it's, uh, um, but of course, it's another place where we've done everything we can to be sure that it'll work. We've rehearsed it, uh, we've reviewed it, we've got all our grouchiest people to come look at it. Uh, we've uh, got two of everything where it's possible. And then we're already practicing um, in our with our digital simulator. How are we going to act uh, as we do this process? So it's it's not the first time when we actually unfold it in space. Anyway, so it takes a while to get there and unfold it and cool down, and then we have to focus the telescope because all those eighteen hexagons they're not yet in the right place. So we take a lot of pictures of we found a particular set of stars to look at. And we should see 18 little blurry, somewhat blurry pictures of one star. And we get to get all those 18 images to line up perfectly and become one. So that's the focusing process. Uh, and then it still takes a while after that before we're really done because the instrument that Evina is talking about, the mid-infrared instrument is even colder than the rest. So we have to turn on its refrigerator, uh, which is, uh, well, it's not so different from your kitchen refrigerator, but it's much colder. And it gets that instrument all the way down to seven Kelvin, seven degrees above absolute zero. So that's not so quick. Anyway, when all of the instruments are finally called, then we say, now we are going to make sure that they all do what we said they would do. They're all in focus. Uh, all of the com commands work. We know how to run all the detectors. All the exposures are set correctly. And that takes all together six months. That's the plan. So assuming total success, we will then have a great unveiling where we say, Look at all this wonderful information that we got. It works. It works beautifully. And then we start taking the scientific data that people have proposed to do. So we've been collecting the plan for the scientific data for some years now. And uh, we, we know more or less what day every exposure will be done. So we, where we're going to point, who's who gets the data, and what happens to the data when it comes in. And so then we uh, will start to tell you. 
at that mm -hmm. point. Now, all the data will become public as they are now from the Hubble. Yeah. So, so Ivina, talk us through this because there's there are several kind of groups of people involved. There's the what co so called guaranteed time holders, the ones who help build the instruments, and those of us have been on the science working group. Then there's early release science projects, which are designed to explore kind of the, the, the edge cases or demonstrate the telescope works well. And then there are open proposals, and that's the majority of the time over the, and not, it's a little bit front loaded on the guaranteed time and the early release science. So, you know, you've been looking at this for a long time. I, I, I'm sure you're as surprised as I am by the enormous weight of people who've come into this project, um, you know, who were not, some, I hate to say it, not even born when we started it. That's for sure. <laughs> um, but well, there they are now. Uh, well, that's indeed uh, the case. I mean, when you think about it, such a long project, indeed, we, I also came in at the sort of the light, late 1990s, uh, my first meetings. And if you think about now, the, the generations of PhD students that, uh, you know, were thinking at that time already about JWST science, but, you know, have moved on. I mean, there have been other missions. Spitzer has happened. Herschel has happened. So, so that's good. But uh, I mean, as sort of somebody involved in the project, you not only need to build the instruments of the telescopes, but you also need to think you need to train the, the young people in, uh, that are going to do the science with it. So, so that is also a responsibility of the universities. Uh, but indeed, I think it's it's good. The, um, the, basically, the countries um, have invested very significantly in building the instruments. That's usually, uh, to a large degree, uh, also funding uh, from um, uh, institutes and uh, uh, and individual member countries, uh, for example, from from ESA. Um, and so, because of those very significant investments, uh, getting some uh, guaranteed time then on the uh, telescope is, is to return to that. Of course, these are also the people that know the instruments and that have seen the instruments that have worked on the instruments. So um, they are also the ones then to, to see, well, uh, understand really how how it is working when they when they get the first data. Uh, but then in the, the, those data are, are proprietary for 12 months. Um, it's very important that the general community gets some data to work with very quickly. And that's why I think the early release science was a, a very good uh, program then to make sure that, uh, and this was again through an open call, that there are teams that put together sort of tasters of what JWST science will be, and those tasters <laughs> uh, data will become public immediately. So they, the proposing team will see the data at the same time as anybody else will see them. Um, and then, as you say, the bulk of the data are coming from the general observers, anybody in the world that could propose um, and there's been a fantastic response to that, and uh, uh, also a good process to select the process proposals. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, now it's a group of probably uh, I don't know how many co-IS PIs, more than a thousand uh, again uh, people that individual PIs and co-IS that uh, are going to get data even in year one. And and, and over four thousand people participated in the proposals. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's highly competitive, of course, and it has been for Hubble for many years. So, um, of course, you know, you, you can't take every idea every time, but we try to pick the best sites. And I think, as you said, Avina, this process this time, if I'm right, it was done double blind, right? I mean, it was done so that you didn't know who was proposing. So there were no, you try to eliminate the biases going, oh, you know, hotshot professor, you know, yes, I'll say yes to them or, or a man as opposed to a woman. And I think that's addressed a lot of the imbalances which have been there. I think it's a... I, I, I haven't yet written a proposal that way myself yet, but it must be a very interesting process to try and make it not well, obvious it, who you are. It is, it is, it is. That's uh, the funniest thing if you start to contradict yourself, you know, you <laughs> say, well, this one, this one, I want to contradict. What, <laughs> what, 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 so you, you, you deliberately, <laughs> deliberately diss one of your own results yes. to make it, <laughs> make it <laughs> obvious it's not you. <laughs> But I mean that's that's one way. I think I think the only thing that is lost in that process is when uh, the people that have uh, really developed a say a analysis method and analysis code or they're doing laboratory experiments yeah. to get the spectra. Now you no longer can say that you know that you're 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 going to measure your own spectra. <laughs> that you have to somehow refer to a public database that doesn't is not yet populated. So. Mm. Yeah, that is tricky, writing a proposal that does not prove who you are. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
Yeah, since in some sense, proposals are about establishing your credibility in the field, why you should get the time and not the person. But arguably, maybe it shouldn't be that way. It should just be the science ideas speak for themselves. But uh, I'm fascinated. Well, by you, need, you need to have done your homework on the I, only an idea is not enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important, too. Nobody gets away. Nobody gets observing time for writing a couple of paragraphs. Yes. It would be yeah. nice if wow, the amount of work that goes into telescope proposals these days and, and a lot of them don't get approved. It's, it's astonishing. Yeah. So, Alex, I don't know if you have any other questions from the, uh, the audience Indeed. there. Well, we have some great ones, um, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, some that might actually require a bit of foregrounding and explanation. Um, you know, for instance, um, Daniel um, uh, in Ottawa uh, says, so why will Webb assume a halo orbit around L2 rather than just a stationary position that would consume less fuel? Ah, uh, actually, it costs less fuel to go to the orbit that we're going to instead of the stationary position just the way that uh, Newton's law has worked out. Uh, and um, the other reason not to go to that special spot is it's in the shadow of the earth. So we need the sunshine to run the telescope. Otherwise it would be perfect. <laughs> I've, I've always been impressed if you know I've forgotten the exact numbers I have to I should recreate them. You know on one side of that sun shield there's a megawatt um, and on the other side we've got to reduce that down to just milliwatts. So, you know, we're kind of desperate to get rid of the sunshine, but we can't operate without it. On the other side, we have to have solar panels. So, you know, being, and we have that with yeah. many of our spacecraft when they go through eclipses, we have to hope the batteries hold out. And as they get older, the batteries don't work as well. So there's always that kind of fingers cross moment in, in eclipses like that. Um, another, you know, interesting. Um, well, PAL0011 asks, would it be economically attractive to make a copy of JWST now that all the technology has been developed and tested. If it gives another 10 years of exploration, you know, while we're at it, why, you know, why have one when you can have two, I think he's asking. <laughs> ah, yeah, my, my thought would be, I just want to make sure we have one. Uh, and in 10 or 20 years after we've got it working, uh, people will say, that was great. I want something different now. We have um, elaborate planning process all around the world to figure out what to do next. So well, there's, 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 a little, there's a little bit of history here because I think this when JWST was originally planned, it was going to be the first of, of several of these deployable telescopes. And once the technology was developed and uh, there were going to be more. And I remember even people saying uh, to me after one of the meetings where we were trying to get the mid-infrared instruments on the telescope, they said, why don't you wait for the next one? Because <laughs> that's... Uh... <laughs> I actually suggested it the other way around. I, I, I got one of the coldest stares I've ever had in my life when I said, uh, probably in early 2000s, I said to Reinhard Gensel, I said, let's stop building Herschel and let's just build a not very good copy of JWST because it doesn't have to focus as sharply for the mid infrared. We'll build that first and then we'll make the, sh the, the super one for the near infrared. Uh, I'm afraid he looked at me like I deserve to die. And of course, he was right as well, because Herschel flew in 2009. And here we are in 2021. So, uh, yeah. Well, but it, we, we, there are no plans for a direct copy of JWST, John, but there are plans afoot, as you're about to say, for big new deployable missions of a different kind. Yeah. Yes. Um, big new ones with uh, more power for different purposes, especially to look for those little planets around nearby stars the exoplanets, which could possibly be a little bit like Earth. Yeah, exactly. Not the ones that are close by, but the ones that are a little bit further out, a little bit more temperate in terms of their uh, in the habitable zone where there could be liquid water, et cetera. That's sort of the next the next uh, uh, dot on the horizon uh, that's, that we have to go for. And the implications of which, of course, are you know absolutely staggering. I mean, which is what makes us all so just Absolutely arresting, I think, for so many viewers tonight as well. Um, and we're getting more questions through um, that I think falls on from what we were just talking about. Brian um, asks, is there a waiting period before the design process for replacement telescope begins so that all the necessary lessons can be incorporated? Or has that process already begun? Oh, you mean for the next telescope after this one? Mm. Oh, well, everybody uh, will say that they learned something. <laughs> we hope that they did. Um, and uh, of course, the first one is, well, don't do it that way. I have a better <laughs> idea. Uh, it always happens that way. Um, but the new ideas people are proposing are really quite different. Um, they have 
great ambition, but the details are all different. I mean, as you said, there is this so-called decadal planning process in the United States, and we have similar road mapping at the national level and now in ESA at the, the agent, space agency level. And so people already have worked for years on uh, missions like Louvois and, and the others in that, uh, that set of four, the big, the big ones which are being looked at. So as you say, you know, technology changes and moves on. Some of the lessons aren't appropriate anymore, although the management ones and the systems engineering ones will, will be eternal. Um, so, but, but I just want to give you the floor a second, John, uh, to talk a little bit about one of the, you know, because you've, you've been in the field a long time, but you haven't finished. You're not done. You've got some crazy, crazy ideas. Yeah. None of your ideas are crazy, but um, this, this wonderful idea of putting artificial stars in space to then let telescopes on the ground get much sharper images. Tell us a little bit about how that. Yeah, well, people have been working on this for uh, 50 years now. Uh, it was, I realized a long time ago that uh, a small telescope that you can buy in the, in the, uh, in the supermarket practically uh, gives almost as sharp an image as the giant, biggest telescopes we can build. And that's because the atmosphere of the orbital earth is very turbulent. And so it wrecks the image quality. So what can you do about this? Well, it'd be great if you had a star you could focus on and say, well, fix up that camera so it gives a sharp image of that star. And that's been implemented as something we call adaptive optics. And it's really hard to do, uh, and, uh, but it's worth it. So if you could do that, then you could get uh, just as sharp an image from a telescope on the ground as you can in space. Well, that would be fabulous. Uh, so we have really big telescopes on the ground and they're getting even bigger. Uh, the biggest one, the most ambitious one is already under construction in South America. It's called the uh, Extremely Large Telescope and the European Southern Observatory is building it. So it's totally gigantic, it's six times the diameter of the Webb telescope. So if we could get any uh, high quality images from that at the places where it's especially important, that would be super. So. As it turns out, the, uh, the, the light that you can see with your eye, the visible light waves are the hardest to do because the wavelength is the shortest, but it's the best if you can make it work. So the artificial star in space would give you something that all of our big telescopes on the ground could focus on. Now, that's hard because you've got to put that little artificial star in the right place. So it, it doesn't just sit there. It's in orbit around the Earth. So we think that we can do it. We've been working on this for a while. So with any kind of luck, we'll be able to persuade a few other people that we should do this and then we'll see. And, and to allay any fears, because I asked you this question when you brought this up a few weeks ago, it's not something that will be light polluting for the whole world. It's not a bright burning thing that sh yeah. it's basically a laser pointing down at a specific location. So you won't right. be able to see it anywhere else. It won't be as polluting as certain yeah. people's satellites are becoming. Right, certain people's satellites are really bright and they're zooming everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think people will be happy to have their internet service, but it's certainly getting in the way of astronomy to have those amazing constellations. Yeah. I know this is a one at a time uh, for one particular telescope to use at a time. And so, so Avino, you know, you're not done either, by no means. Well, you know, let's get JWST out of the way five years from now, right? It'll all be great. What next? What, what, what's the thing that really excites you that's coming over the horizon? If not for you, for your students and your postdocs and everybody yeah, else. That, uh, well, I, I mean, first of all, if you talk about uh, the ground again, um, I think OMA is still doing fantastic. And, and OMA is just scratching the surface. So OMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's almost in space, but still on the ground at 5,000 meters uh, altitude, uh, a breathtaking experience to be there. Uh, but it's uh, uh, 66 uh, telescopes at millimeter wavelengths. So this is more you know, like antennas uh, at radio wavelengths, but they're at very short uh, radio wavelengths. And that's where we can also penetrate those dusty uh, regions and make very sharp images of our, of our planet forming uh, disks um, and, and also the, the uh, looking at the molecules there. So, so Alma, uh, another 20, 30 <laughs> years is, is going to be fantastic. Uh, but uh, as uh, John was mentioning, the ELT, an uh, extremely large telescope that uh, the European Southern Observatory is building, um, that is basically same uh, wavelength coverage as JWST. Of course, 
very much uh, hampered by the atmosphere. So you only have tiny little windows where you can look through the atmosphere. But then it's very sharp uh, because it has such a large, uh, very, very large mirror. So, so that is something that we're looking forward to absolutely as well. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, people, we've heard it from, we were just without naming names, the people who say, don't worry about your constellate my constellations because all astronomy is going to be done in space in the future um, this is a complete misnomer i mean there's obvious complementarity when you talk about x-rays versus visible but the elt is a much bigger telescope than jwst but it doesn't do the same so it's, it's very complementary and i think people exactly. forget that we knit these things together very carefully yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, uh, what we were talking about, the next step in space to have a very big optical telescopes that can look for these tiny little planets and look for, you know, search for signs of life in the atmospheres of those planets. Fantastic goal, but it's going to take uh, many years <laughs> to build it, <laughs> uh, just like JWST took uh, 30 years. Uh, so it's going to be uh, a while before that is there. And, uh, and, and then it's just going to have, you know, it's just going to be one telescope again for a number of years so so there is needs to be more there needs to be complementarity uh, between small and big missions uh, between ground and space mm. yeah. and i thinking of some of the missions we're going to be flying in the future dark energy mission euclid um and plato an exoplanet mission yeah they're, yeah. they're absolutely built in they you know, I, I hate to say they won't work without the ground-based data there's a there's a yeah. very direct link you, you take your data i take mine we put them together we solve a problem and i yeah. think that's important as well so, Alex, I, I hand back to you if there's any last questions from the from the audience. Well, you know, um, yeah, there, there are some fantastic ones, you know, um, you know, coming through, which is uh, which is always very encouraging, you know. Um, but I think the the overall feeling um, you know, that I have, and I think is, you know, definitely confirmed by the people watching is, I think, something that you and I, Mark, agree on. And we've talked about before, which is that the most exciting time for exploration and discovery is right now. You know, that's why we're shouting about these things from the rooftops. That's why we're so thrilled to be joined by people like Avina and John to discuss these things because everything is just around the corner. And um, well, I'm just so excited to see what happens, I guess a little later this year. And um, like many people will be watching intently um, on behalf of everyone at Space Rocks, we wanna thank you both for joining. And Mark, um, you know, uh, I leave this to you. This is a, this is always a slightly awkward moment. Not, well, not to scare anybody, but you know, um, I, it, it, you know, it, it's 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 more or less scary. It depends who. I mean, I've known John since 1988. I've known Avina probably not not far off that. You know, two of the most senior astronomers in the world, and I'm going to make them do silly hand gestures. So, but. I'm sure if, if, if it will make sense to you, we have this one, which is space. So this is the Vulcan salute. It's always a challenge to see who can actually separate their middle fingers. <laughs> and then we do this one, which is the, the for, for music, space and rocks. So uh, they're both challenged here. I'm not quite sure. Are we going to get you to do that? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very embarrassed, but you know, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you'll forgive me both the next time. Next time we get to meet, which has been far too long. Ivina, you're not far from me. I know, just kilometers away. Um, and it's crazy that we haven't seen each other crossed on the bike path oh, at least. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I cycle a lot. I should. I have a high cross section to seeing people on the bike. Maybe, maybe I, the problem is my velocity is high. So maybe there's. <laughs> I don't know. And John, I look forward to seeing you as well. Uh, hopefully later this year. We're all trying to figure out exactly where we'll be for the launch uh, mm -hmm. later this year. But my goodness me, after such a long time, it's it's absolutely thrilling to think that it's just around the corner. It truly is. Yeah, and and look, we've 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 invited you on as representatives this evening, and we'll be talking to more people in the coming months. But the critical thing again is that there are thousands of people involved in this, on behalf of the general public who are paying for it. And you know, it sounds trite to say that, but we need to step back occasionally and realize what we've, that what the privilege we've been given to be able to do this as a living is remarkable. Um, but hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to show some of those fantastic images and, uh, and, and spectra as well. No, let, never forget the spectra. That's just as important. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. And I hope to see you both soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take Good care. Time. And uh, to all the viewers, uh, thank you very much for, for watching. And I hope you're well. And please stay safe and healthy. <laughs> yes. And wish the racket luck. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Indeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Wow, we...
Well then, Mark, um, you know, as ever, um, you know, I'll, I'll confess, you know, to being a little intimidating. I mean, as, as, you know, as the only non astrophysicist in the proverbial room. Um, but, uh, but then again, I should never feel that way because it's just, uh, um, the, the importance of science communications, um, and putting ideas across so everyone can understand, um, you know, is, is always emphasized by chats like this, just because we have absolutely just spanned the universe tonight. Yeah. And it's really hard not to just be just almost giddy with excitement about what's going to happen later this year. Right. I mean, I mean, just, wow. Uh, I was asked earlier today, so I was filming some interviews for, for documentaries, and one of them is about JWST, unsurprisingly, and I, I can't remember exactly what the question was, but, you know, I, you know it, was, it was one of those, you know, so what's your final thought, you know, if you've got something else that you'd like to bring forward? And I will say this, you know, it's been a long time, and, it, and there's been, you know, there's been some snark uh, in the media, there's been some snark in the, uh, the astronomy community about, you know, why has it taken so long? To build this machine and i think the privilege of being close up to it is seeing the process and, and why it's been so difficult there's never been a moment where we've said let's take a year off and go to the beach you know people and particularly the people on the instrument team the telescope team have been working like crazy to get to this point point. and you know what all that kind of snark about you know that it's late it's delayed um it's my, my faith throughout that has been that it's going to do amazing things because there has been nothing else that's come along in the meantime that touches most of the science that JWST does. And we've done it. We in the biggest sense. The agencies, the engineers, the scientists, the general public, the politicians who've had faith to let us keep doing it. We've built this thing and it's just that close to flying now. Uh, what an exciting time. I mean, what a nervous time as well, because it, you, you, know, you don't just build it and leave it in a shed. It's got to get into orbit and deploy. So uh, thrilling times ahead. And I hope we can come back in some future episodes and, and talk because there's so much that JWST does. We can dig in a little bit more detail with some of the younger scientists as well who are going to be, they weren't around at the time, but they're going to be exploiting this machine. I think there's so much more to cover in the coming months. So I hope we can do that. I fully agree. I think we absolutely should because, um, you know, these are big questions being asked and, uh, well, also at the human level, it's going to be a nail biter later <laughs> here. So we should definitely be tapping into some of that, the human drama as well. We should never forget that, uh, you know, the human beings behind all these things and, uh, and they have hopes as well. So Mark has an absolute pleasure as ever, as we, um, complete episode 49. I mean, not that we're, uh, you know, just, um, awash with symbolism, the space rocks, but, Wow, nearly 50 episodes. What a pleasure yeah. it's been. To do. Yes. Well, let's see where oh. we come back uh, with episode 50, um, hopefully soon. Um, some of us, you and me at least, and, and Detlef and others who are watching have some kilometers still to cover tomorrow to finish off on that charity. If anybody's watching and you want to donate some money to charity, look up Heavy Metal Truants. It's all to a good cause and it keeps us looking so young and youthful. All that <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As just a filter in my case. Yeah, yeah Mark, an absolute pleasure. Well, well happy writing. And, um, you know, right. uh, well, thank you for joining him, Insurance. And as ever, a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks so much for your time. We'll Thanks, see Alex. Everybody. See everybody.